Today we're going to be in Mark chapter 3. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them to Mark chapter 3. But for those of you guys who are really disciplined Bible studiers, I want to highlight a couple of other passages I'm going to reference today and read, but that won't be on the screen. And so if you'd like to go ahead and mark those in your Bibles to follow along, you can. The first one that we'll get to is in Mark chapter 7 verses 5 through 8 and 20 through 23, so you can mark that one. The second one is in Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 9 and 10, and the final one is in Ezekiel chapter 36. So Mark 7, Jeremiah 17, and Ezekiel 36. We will be referencing those passages, so if you want to put a bookmark in your Bible or pin down a page, we're going to meander our way over there as we talk about the heart, as we talk about the heart. Also, before I begin, there's a book, some of you may have read this before, this is called Renovation of the Heart. It's by an author named Dallas Willard, and if you've ever wanted to think more completely about the human heart and its importance in regards to the gospel, but just in life, this would be a book I want to commend to you. I'll reference it a couple of times today, but if you are looking for a book to read and you are looking for something to help you understand the heart, no better place to go outside of the Bible than Renovation of the Heart by Dallas Willard. So who in the room watches The Chosen? Anyone watch The Chosen? If you do raise your hand, that might help me understand where we are. Okay, so about half the room. My family and I, we love watching The Chosen, especially Dorothy and I. When we get the kids down, if like a new season just came out, so our big thing was we're going to watch The Chosen, and we love it because together we get to kind of, it kind of puts a picture on what the environment around Jesus may have been like. Now, The Chosen is not the Bible, okay? And so if you look to the chosen as the Bible, it's going to frustrate you because it doesn't go verse by verse, and it's not a substitute for your own time in God's Word. But I love the chosen because it kind of paints a picture of what life would have been like, and specifically, I don't know if if you have seen it, there's an episode where Jesus heals Jairus' daughter. And if you have seen this episode, then you'll know right where I'm talking. So Jesus heals this man's daughter. He walks out of the house, and there's a Pharisee standing right there on the way out. And if you've seen this particular episode, the Pharisee says, you got to go, you've got unclean hands. You touch something dead. You got to go wash. And the disciples all just laugh at him. And so does Jesus. Because, you know, the Pharisee just witnessed Jesus raise someone from the dead And his first priority was, you're ceremonially unclean. I mean, how could you do that? How could you witness a miracle and at the same time just be so unable to see the truth of things right there? And I love that part of The Chosen because the more I think about Jesus' interactions with the Pharisees, the more astounded I become that they just could not, that they would not, and in some cases just refused to see Jesus as the promised Savior of all. No matter how many miracles he performed, no matter how well he answered their questions, no matter how compassionate he may have been to those in need, they always seemed to oppose his message. They questioned his motives, demonized those he served, and ultimately plotted his death. And if you've been here for the last several weeks, Pastor Deke has done an excellent job at diagnosing some of the issues the Pharisees had. He's done a great job at applying some of the blindsidedness that they had towards Christ to our own lives. And so my hope this morning, as we look at Mark chapter 3, is to really build on the foundation that Pastor Deke has laid for us as we think about the Pharisees. So here is the question that as I begin preparation in Mark chapter 3, and as I've been listening to Deke really do just, I mean, a fantastic job describing this uh, in, in really laying out this series of invisible Pharisees. The question I keep asking is, why were they so opposed to the message of Jesus? I mean, why? What was the foundational issue that they so disagreed with Jesus about that on nearly every occasion that we see them interacting with Jesus, with a couple notable exceptions, maybe Nicodemus being one, Well, they they argue with him over a variety of issues. You know, even when they witness miracles, like that we're going to read about in just a moment in Mark 3, or when Jesus raised raised Lazarus from the dead, why did they still plot to kill him? Why, in nearly every encounter, did the Pharisees argue with Jesus about the Sabbath, about his healings, about his companions, and the time with, with people that he spent? 
Why did they debate with him over the meaning of scriptures, over the Roman Empire? Why, in every case, did they just so stubbornly refuse to listen or obey anything that Jesus said? I'm going to argue this morning, and I think we're going to see it in the text of Mark chapter 3 and throughout Jesus' interactions with the Pharisees, that they could not and would not see Jesus as their Savior. They couldn't hear his message of redemption. They couldn't follow him as did his disciples because at the core of their opposition to Jesus was a fundamental disagreement about the state of the human heart. If you had to reduce all of the conflict that Jesus has with the Pharisees to one fundamental disagreement, it would be about the state of the human heart. Now, at my house, I'm kind of responsible for the yard. And... um, and it, at my house, there is, when they built the house, they seeded one part of the house, and the rest of it is just wild, it's whatever. But there's this one part of my front yard, and if you've been there, you know, that's the part you really try to keep up. The rest of it, you just do what you can, but this particular part, it needs to be perfect. You know, you, it needs to be so nice you can walk through it barefoot with no problems. But there's this particular weed that I loathe and hate above all other weeds. And maybe you've seen it. It's a really long weed that has these little white flowers, and it grows into the grass. It's really hard to spot. And so I decided to make it my personal vendetta to eliminate this weed from my front yard. So for like three weeks every day, and my wife, and you know, Deacon, I'm sure Lauren may say the same to you, was complaining, why are you always in the yard? Can't you help me with the kids? And I would say, I just got to get rid of this weed. I just have to. And so one day, I, I picked the last one out, and I thought, man, I'm doing great. Well, the next day it rained, and they were already back. <sighs> and so Beyond the feelings of inadequacy that I felt, I'm no Ray Toot in fixing yards for kind of a post-retirement living, um, I, I was like, man, what's going on? So I went out there and I began to pull up this particular thing and maybe because it was so wet, all of a sudden when I pulled it, this massive underlying structure came up and I realized that no matter how many times I pulled the tops off these weeds, I thought I was pulling out the weeds from the ground. No matter what I did, because I wasn't getting to the root of the problem, I couldn't fix it. And that, I would argue, is what's happening here with the Pharisees. You see, the events in Mark 3, 1 through 6, they happen on the Sabbath. And on the surface, the confrontation with the Pharisees seems to be about our interpretation of the Sabbath. But when you look very closely at the text, as we're going to in just a moment, you're going to see that the difference between Jesus and the Pharisees was a disagreement about the state of the heart. And because the Pharisees kept trying to find ways to fix problems which they could become acceptable to God, they failed to diagnose the real issue, which is the state of the heart. So would you read with me in Mark chapter 3, starting in verse 1. Another time Jesus went into the synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked them, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they remained silent. So then in verse 5, so he looked at them with anger, And he was deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts. And he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians on just how they might kill Jesus. And this brings us to our first major point today. That is, what you believe about the condition of the heart will determine how you respond to Jesus. I want to say that again. What you believe about the condition of the heart will determine how you respond to Jesus. Let's look at the setting of Mark chapter 3. So in Mark 3, the author describes a situation where Jesus walks into a trap. If you guys ever walked into a situation like that? I have. It is not fun. And my first response is to kind of try to, how can I get out of the situation? But, you know, so if you look at the setting, it says, another time Jesus went into the synagogue, a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely. Jesus is walking into a trap. He walks in, and voila! There's a man with a shriveled hand, and at the same time, you can imagine these Pharisees on the other side, these religious teachers, and they're watching Jesus. Do they care about the man? 
No. Do they really care about the Sabbath? Well, not really, to tell you the truth. All they were cared about was this was going to be the situation where they could find enough evidence to make the case that Jesus should be put to death. So that's the setting. So it's on the Sabbath. The Sabbath is the day where we're supposed to rest, to be with God, to reflect on him. We do this on Sundays now in Christianity. You had a man with a withered hand there. I'm not sure what that meant. I could imagine it was an issue with his tendons that caused his hand not to be able to open. That's just a guess. But when I read this story, that's kind of what I pictured. You have the religious teachers off to one side, and then you have the audience all those other people who are coming to synagogue, just like we come to church on a Sunday morning, who are there, and then you have Jesus, and Jesus invites this man to stand up in front of everyone. So not only does Jesus understand that this is a trap, but now he's about to make an example and really proclaim a fundamental truth about life that it's very easy to miss if we don't read our Bibles carefully. So here's a question. Why Was Jesus healing this man potentially on the Sabbath? He did heal him. Why was this against the commandment to keep the Sabbath? That's that's a great question. So the original command for a Sabbath, we see it in Genesis 1 to tell you the truth, but in Exodus uh, chapter 20, verse 8, Moses kind of lists this for us. This comes directly from God. It says this, Remember my Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but on the seventh day... Um, on the seventh day, um, excuse me, but the seventh day is Sabbath to our Lord our God, and on it you shall not work. All right, so this, I would argue, is where the disagreement with Jesus and the Pharisees begin to manifest itself. Um, Edmund Hybert, who wrote a commentary on Mark, Pastor Deke's commentary, thanks for letting me borrow it, he said this about this passage. He said, but according to their Sabbath regulations, he's talking about the Pharisees, to perform such a work of healing on the Sabbath would be unlawful. Healing measures might be taken on the Sabbath, but only if there was a danger of death. They were concerned not with the man's need, but with their legalistic prescriptions. For an eagerness to fence the law against violation, they had gone to extremes in stipulating acts that were regarded as work. In other words, they looked at this act of a man being healed as being against God's command to build, uh, to work on the Sabbath. Now, when I was a kid, Um, I was at a kids camp one summer and we went to the beach and we had a task It was a sandcastle building contest and the prize if you won the sandcastle building contest was you got your ice cream first Now that's a pretty bad prize, but to like a 10 year old me I wanted to get my ice cream first very important And so me and my team we built our sandcastle and it was awesome, but there was a problem What's the problem with sandcastles being built on the beach anyone? That's right, they get washed away. And so we thought, well, if our sandcastle is going to last, we need to build a wall. And so we built our first wall around the whole sandcastle. But then we realized that our wall wasn't sufficient. It was just made of sand. So we scoured the beach. We found driftwood. We found reeds. We built them all into our wall. Our wall kind of looked like the framing of a house after it was finished, to tell you the truth. But then we realized something else. One wall would not do. So we built a second wall around the first wall. And then we realized that needed some extra protection, so we went and we found some more stuff. And after we had our two walls in place, what do you think we did? We needed another wall, because two walls was not enough. So we built another one, like a, like a little div- division in the front, so that the waves would go to either side to protect our sandcastle. So when um, Miss Cindy Campbell, who was the children's director, came by, she asked me the question. She said, what did you guys build here? Is this a sandcastle, or is this the Great Wall of China? Because... We missed the point in our eagerness to protect our castle from the ocean. We actually, the wall became more important than the castle itself. And that's exactly what happened with the Pharisees. They were so eager to create a system where goodness would be the result of just following rules that they misinterpreted the Bible because they were so focused on the wall, their tradition. And so that's what happened with the Pharisees. They missed the point. They weren't able to read the scripture correctly because they were so focused on building up rules and regulations so that they wouldn't infringe on God's law and therefore be accepted by God himself. And so this is what the Pharisees tried to accomplish with their rules. They tried so hard to ensure that by action they could create an environment where every heart would become acceptable to God. 
But in doing so, they missed the whole focus of Jesus' teaching and by implication, the entire message of the Bible, that every heart needs renovation, not just regulation. You see, notice what Jesus, what made Jesus so momentarily angry and distressed. It wasn't merely that they, they misunderstood the Sabbath, but rather the fact that they had hardened hearts that wouldn't allow them to see that their hearts were truly in a state of ruin. Their hearts were in such ruin that they couldn't cure it, of ruin so deep that a new heart and a new heart alone would be necessary, but that a new heart could only come through faith in Jesus himself. Look at verse five again. He says, he looked around at them in anger and he was deeply distressed by their stubborn hearts. He said to the man, stretch out your hand and he stretched it out and it was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. How astounding. They witnessed something completely miraculous and yet their hearts were just as committed to Jesus' downfall as they were before. So what else could Jesus have done? It's no small, sma so ma ma small matter that Jesus was angry at their response, but truly the issue was he was so broken over the hardness of their hearts. And guess what? If we read Mark 3, 1 through 6 within the proper context, we can see that the real focus of Jesus' interactions with the Pharisees by Mark is not necessarily about the specific infractions that they debated about but it's about a more fundamental and far more eternally significant issue, the state of the heart. So if you look at the context of Mark chapter three, you'll notice that Mark three kind of comes on the end of five straight interactions Jesus has with the Pharisees. They kind of form a, a loop, starting in Mark chapter two and then concluding in verse six of Mark chapter three. And these five different interactions with Jesus and the Pharisees come over a variety of issues. The first one is over the healing of the man who was paralyzed, the paralytic. You take up your mat and walk. The second one, if I remember my order correct, correctly, was over the people that Jesus spent time with, tax collectors and sinners. The third one was on an, a debate about fasting, why Jesus' disciples didn't fast, why the Pharisees said you should fast. The fourth one was about Jesus picking these heads of grain during his their walk into the city, his disciples picking heads of grain, they're saying that's work. And the fifth one that we just read momentarily, just, just a second ago, Jesus' confrontation about healing on the Sabbath. But if you look closely at how Mark structures his text, if you look at the story of the man with the paralytic, and you pick it up in chapter 2, verse 6, I want you to listen closely. See if you can identify the issue that Mark is trying to help us see. So in verse 6 of chapter 2, it says this. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there, and they were thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? Again, he's going to heal the paralytic, and he's making a point about salvation. He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit what they were thinking. This is the key word. In their hearts. And this is where the heart is introduced as the main theme of this entire narrative that follows all the way through the verse 6 of chapter 3. And it's almost as if Mark is trying to get us as readers of the Bible to see that the heart is the issue. All these different disagreements about healing on the Sabbath, fasting, about who Jesus spends his, his time with, they all come back to the heart. And so as we look at Mark chapter three, it's important that we realize that yes, we could talk about the point of the Sabbath and all of these things, and that's important. But what Mark is trying to do is show us that no matter what Jesus did, the Pharisees could not see the truth of his message because they disagreed about the state of the heart. You see, Mark frames these confrontations in this way, but if you zoom out even more, to the book of Mark, you can really see that in Mark chapter seven, remember I told you to bookmark a place earlier. In Mark seven, Jesus really highlights this truth that Mark is introducing to us here in chapters two and three. So in Mark seven, starting in verse five, we read this and Deke actually referenced this passage in one of his sermons a couple of weeks ago. But we read this. So the Pharisees and the teachers of the law asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? So what's the surface level issue? Clean hands when you eat, right? Now, is it a good thing to wash your hands before you eat? Yes. But do you have to wash your hands like four times before you eat just to show everyone else 
that your hands are clean or does it really matter whether or not your hands are clean? The point is, that's again a surface level issue. And then look how Jesus responds in verse six. Jesus replied, Isaiah was right. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. For as it is written, these people honor me with their lips. Here's the key phrase. But their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. They've let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. Skip forward to verse 20 of the same of Mark 7. He went on, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For it's from within, out of a person's heart, that evil things come. Evil thoughts come. Sexual morality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All of these evils come from inside and they defile a person. You know what Jesus is saying to his, his, the Pharisees right there? What you believe about the heart is going to determine how you respond to Jesus' message. The Pharisees of Jesus' day were so focused on their rules and traditions. They were so focused on the fact that if they just did the right things, the heart could be constrained and made acceptable to God, and they failed to recognize the overwhelming truth about the heart from the Old Testament. Jesus quoted from Isaiah, but he also references Jeremiah 17. I mentioned that text earlier. Jeremiah 17, verse 9 and 10, it says this, the heart is deceitful. It's deceitful above all things, and it's beyond cure. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I examine the mind to reward each person according to their conduct, according to what their deeds deserve. And then Ezekiel 36, of course, where God says this. He says, for I will take you out of the nations. And notice, notice the action in Ezekiel 36. It's all God. I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. I will. Again, any action of humanity so far in this text in Ezekiel? None. I will sprinkle clean water on you and, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit in you to move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Jesus, citing the Old Testament, argues that the heart is unfixable. It's incapable of remedy for no matter how much you do, you can't fix something by mere human effort by the work of human hands and with a human will that is broken beyond repair. So if our understanding of the state of the heart determines how we respond to Jesus, how do we apply this truth to our lives today? Well, there are three key ideas that I think flow out of Mark chapter three that we all need to grasp so that we can really understand and respond to Jesus as he invites us to, with surrender. And the first of those key truths is that if you fail to recognize the ruined condition of the heart, you always have a hardened heart towards Jesus. If you start from the supposition that the heart is essentially good and capable of saving, you'll never be able to respond to Jesus correctly, and your heart will always be hardened towards the things that he does and the things that he says. If you look at, back at verse 5 of Mark chapter 3, look what Jesus says to the Pharisees. He says he looks at them in anger, deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts. Edmund Hybert commenting on this, he says this, Jesus' anger was mingled with grief at the sinful attitude of his opponents. The tense in Greek here implies that the look of anger was momentary, but the grieved word is in the present tense, picturing a prolonged feeling of grief or distress at such men. The verb is in a compound form, denoting his deep grief. He felt intense grief at the hardening of their heart, denoting a process, their obstinate and willful resistance to the truth that indicated a process of hardening was taking place, rendering their heart, their inner moral being, more and more unresponsive. A hardened heart towards Jesus begins with the acceptance of the belief that the world, and specifically, more importantly, the heart, is fixable. You can fix the problems of the heart by education, by religious compulsion, by comparison. And this, I would argue, is the greatest obstacle and the most profound issue regarding lostness in the world today. Because the only solution that can make an eternal difference is to have a heart that is renovated, 
restarted, remade, redeemed by grace. You can't fix it. And yet, if we fail to realize that our heart is in a state of ruin without a genuine revisioning and a redirecting of our lives, then we'll never be able to solve the issue of having a heart that's acceptable to God. When I, when I was in Jordan for two years, I, I want to share a story uh, very briefly of a man named Abu Salah. Now, Abu Salah was the owner of a coffee shop, and I would go there all the time, and over about a three-month period, we built up a really good relationship. And so, for three months, I had been working on how can I help this guy come to know Christ. And so, I remember we would talk and talk and talk, and finally, at about two in the morning on a Friday night, we began to have a conversation about the gospel. And I was trying to make the point that our hearts are in a state of ruin, and they need res restoration. And he had shared about his kind of, he was married, but it's, you know, he was very promiscuous. He was telling me about a particular trip that he would take when you drive to the airport from the city of Amman. It's about 20 miles outside the city. And what I didn't know is that there are rest stops along the way, and it's not publicized because that would be illegal, and, and it is illegal, but oftentimes men would leave the city on the way to the airport, and they would stop at places where they would pay for um, the services of ladies, shall we say, okay? And, um, and I, I was trying to make the case, Abu Salah, that's wrong. You can't do that. And he looked at me, and I never, ever, ever will forget what he said, because it made me feel like Jesus must have felt in the passage. And he looked at me, and he said, why should I feel bad at ladies revealing themselves to me. It's their fault. Now, all of us in the room, we have a collective sigh, right? But in his mind, the heart wasn't unfixable, and the outward actions that he took didn't change his heart, right? And in other words, he couldn't see. I remember walking out of that cafe at like three in the morning thinking, God, help me. I don't know what to do. He can't see it. He just can't see it. It all floated from the fact that he had a heart that was hardened towards the gospel. And two quick points of application as we close. If you have a heart that's hardened towards the gospel, then lostness is the natural condition of the heart. This would be our third slide. You see, you can't have a transformed heart without recognizing that we, we have a ruined heart. You see, when we think about lostness, oftentimes we think about the destination, being separated from God for an eternity. But that's not really what lostness is. To be lost is to be someone who is useless in terms of what God designed us to do. And it's because we don't do what God asks us to do that we end up being away from him for an eternity. That's what it means to be lost. It means be incapable of doing what God asks. Could there be a better picture of the Pharisees? The most educated men of their day, the most knowledgeable about the scripture, and yet fundamentally lost because they didn't see their need for grace. They didn't see that following Jesus, this is our final point, requires a renovated heart. It requires a renovation of the heart. Dallas Willard, writing on this subject, says this, the revolution of Jesus is a revolution of the human heart. It did not and does not proceed by the means of formation of societal institutions and laws or any other outer form of existence, intending that these might impose a kind of good order on life where the heart could be fixed. Rather, Jesus' revolution is one of character, which proceeds by changing people from the inside out, through an ongoing personal relationship with Christ. You see, we can respond to the truth of God in three ways. The first one is we can have a hardened heart towards Christ because we believe that the heart is fixable, that we can change it, we can educate it, that somehow that can make us acceptable to God. We'll never see the message of the gospel. For most of us in the room this morning, that's not where we lie. The second thing is that we can agree with Jesus that our heart needs renovation, but that we can just stop life with, I've accepted Jesus, and then we can try to reinterpret his words to make our lives look more comfortable, or we can do the one thing that the Pharisees couldn't, and the one thing that Jesus is calling you to do this morning, and that is to surrender everything. We sung in our song just a moment ago, uh, Living Hope, and I just want to read this phrase as we close. In desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. 
That is the condition of those who understand their need for a renovated heart. Until we get to the place where we can come to Jesus and say, God, help me. Have mercy on me, as Deke preached about the other day, a sinner. Only when we get there will we have a renovated heart and be able to follow Jesus and do what he asks. So the invitation this morning is to respond. If you've been walking with Christ for a long time, then, then praise him. Respond to this invitation to give your life and to order it around pursuing him. If you don't know Jesus, this morning respond to his call of grace on your heart. And if you're wondering this morning, should I really surrender everything? Do I really need to take Jesus' words at, at face value? Then I invite you to respond. So would you all bow your heads with me? Father, as we think about your message, about the goodness of the gospel, we're reminded today that there is nothing that we can do to fix our hearts. We're reminded that no matter how many things we try, no matter what we try to put in place, we will never be able to please you, Father. And so I pray for everyone in the room this morning, myself included. Would you just pray this simple prayer, whether you've been following Christ for a lifetime or whether you want to follow him today for the first time? Father, have mercy on me. I trust you, Jesus. I trust that you lived the life I couldn't, that you died the death that I should, so that by your resurrection, I can have what is yours by right, by grace. Jesus, help me to seek you and to follow you with all of my heart. So God, we love you. Thank you for being so good to us. Encourage us as we serve your purpose today. In Jesus' name, amen. If you've responded to the gospel this morning, we have some folks in the back at our next step signs. We'd love to talk to you. I would love to talk to you. And with all that, let's have a blessed day. Thank you guys for your time.